salutations to everybody out there in podcast land. This is the Judo Chop Suey Podcast, and I'm your host, Judo Dave Roman. What's going on, everybody? Hope all of you are doing well. I am doing very well. Thank you very much, except for my thumb. I've managed to somehow injure my thumb, whether it's through training or whether it's through playing too many video games. <laughs> That's actually truthful. I wonder if it's because of the video game. I've been hooked on Black Ops 3. It was a game that was released for free on the PS4. If you, any of you are gamers out there, feel free to add me as a friend at La Vida Judoka. And I've been getting a kick out of this game. I've gotten really good at it with my awesome 1.8 KDR. So I've been playing a lot of Team Deathmatch, and, and maybe that's part of the reason why my thumb is sore. Now... I've talked about video gaming in the past. I am 43 years old. I've been playing video games since 1980, and I don't see myself stopping anytime soon. It's a guilty pleasure of mine. And quite frankly, being getting up there in age, it really makes me feel young, especially when I play a game like Black Ops 3. You know, I, I enjoy talking trash to the players, and uh, one of my favorite strategies, which gives me my awesome KDR, is I'm a camper. And what many of you complain about and talk about camping, saying, oh, you know, you're a camper. Well, you know what I call that? I call that winning. Because what I like to do in some of these rooms where I'm hiding out in the corner, <laughs> aiming down the sights, I drop a couple of mines and a shock charge, and I see you guys jump through the window, and bam! You guys get shocked. You, if, and if my mind doesn't get you, I'm aiming right down the sights and shooting you right in the head. So I, I'm enjoying the game immensely. It's a lot of fun. At first, I didn't like it. I thought it was kind of similar to Titanfall 2. But uh, for whatever reason, I'm totally hooked on it. I've stopped playing Madden, and I'm all about Black Ops 3. And, and kudos to Activision. They've hooked me. I'm probably going to pre-order Black Ops 4, which is the first pre-order that I've done in years. Uh, the last one I did was was uh, Assassin's Creed Unity. Ever since that atrocity was released, I swore that I would never, ever pre-order a game ever again. But um, I think you guys hooked me, Activision. Uh, kudos to you. Anyway, I'm not here to talk about my video gaming prowess. I'm here to talk about all things judo, and I'm very excited to do so. On this episode, I'm going to talk about the Marius Visor Q&A. He held a Q&A. It was either July 10th or 11th, I can't quite remember, but Marius Visor made himself available once again. He does these Q&As uh, probably about four or five times a year, and I'm very grateful that he does that because, hey, look, he's the, the head of a major sports organization. It's not like I see Adam Silver of the NBA going on a live Q&A uh, Twitter session. No, maybe he does, and I just am not aware of it, but... Uh, I appreciate Mr. Visor making himself available and answering one of my questions. I'll be able, I'll be getting to that. And out of that Q and A, I want to talk about a really interesting issue happening in Georgian judo. Now, I'm not talking about the state of Georgia. I'm talking about the country Georgia. And there's a crazy thing happening over in uh, with a Georgian judo federation that I was not made aware about until. I saw this Twitter Q and A. It's it's pretty wild, and I gotta say, for all the complaining people have done in years past about USA Judo, well, what's happening in Georgian Judo far is far worse, uh, so it seems, than than anything that's happened in the past uh, with USA Judo. And when I mean the past, I mean the past because I know USA Judo has greatly improved over the past couple of years, and and kudos to 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 them. I am also going to review Neil Adams' Tai Otoshi, The Ultimate Study. I'm going to break this down. I'm going to talk about the, the good, which there's plenty of, and, and, and probably some areas of critique that I have about the site in general. You guys got to remember, uh, I am not a podcaster or a judo instructor by trade. I am a software quality assurance analyst, so... Software testing and this kind of reviewing is what I do uh, for a job. So I'm going to be very fair and balanced and and give you my thoughts on Tayotoshi, the ultimate study. But first, it's time for my favorite segment of the Judo Chop Suey podcast. What time is it? Listener reaction. 
I've received some nice listener reaction over the past, uh, well, since I released my last episode uh, that I did with Judo Joe once again. Uh, Joe, thank you very much for joining the podcast. Um, yeah, I've gotten some email, uh, some reaction on, on Reddit through personal messages and some messages on Facebook. Uh, special shout out to the fellow who listens way out in Thailand. I really appreciate you checking in and listening and adding me as a friend on Facebook, which I invite all of you to do. But I'd like to highlight a special email that I received just a couple days ago, and I, I, I'm really touched by this, and I just wanted to share it with all of you. Um, the emailer said that I could use his first name in the email, so I will. Hello, Mr. Roman. My name is Farron, and I am writing to thank you for creating your judo podcast. I have listened to almost every episode Oh boy, I, that early stuff was rough, so I appreciate you hanging in there. And because of it, I have decided to try judo. I have been doing martial arts for about three years, mostly Thai boxing and Brazilian jiu-jitsu, but I have always thought judo was interesting. Upon searching for resources to learn more about judo, I found that they were very few, your podcast being one of the only ones I could find. I have found the only dojo in my area where they speak fluent English and will be signing up next week. Do you have any tips for me? They only offer two classes a week, so I'm hoping to supplement my training and learning in other ways. In particular, I am interested in injury prevention since I am nearly 40 and relatively small. Also, I have no idea where to begin in terms of techniques. I've been practicing break fallings, but don't know anything else to focus on. Thanks again, and please let me know of any ways I can support your work. The best, Farron. Well, Farron, thank you very much for emailing me. And I, I got to say, I've gotten a few emails over the past year and a half or so of people actually starting judo because of this this podcast. And I, I, I'm really, I am really surprised and really touched by that. I, I, to me, that's a win. Because when it comes right down to it, and I've said this before, look, I'm just a buffoon behind a microphone that figured out how to press record and just blather on about judo for whatever topics I feel like touchy, talking about on any given week. So I am really grateful for for everybody that listens, and I am especially grateful to you, Pat Farron, for, for giving judo a chance and, and to becoming part of our uh family our judo family so i thank you very much now in terms of your specific questions the most important thing to me is to make sure that your break falling your ukemi is something that you become comfortable with and it is something that you need to become comfortable with not just on a crash pad but but on the actual tatami or whatever mat area you're using hopefully in whatever dojo you are at, they actually have uh, judo mats and not just these one-inch puzzle mats uh, that they're throwing on top of concrete because that's tough. That's that's a tough ask even for me with the experience that I have. So number one, definitely become uh, more confident in your break falling to the point where you are not afraid to take a fall from any direction but uh, by, by anybody. Now, I, I let me clarify that by anybody. If you if you recognize that there's a guy in your club that is being unsafe, um, and this is actually a suggestion number two. If you recognize somebody that you feel is being unsafe or not treating you with the kind of care that you need as a beginner, I would not work out with those people until you have gained more experience and more skills to be able to defend against people who are just uh, really ignorant of other people's needs. And I'll call it that, just ignorance. Now, my third suggestion, it kind of goes along with point one and two, is that you have to accept who you are in your life right now. And this really goes for any of you middle-aged uh, judoka out there. I, it's certainly been a tough transition for me personally. I've talked about this in the past, just seeing my my physical speed, you know, my, my, my speed just go. It's just, you know, over the past certainly five years and especially 10 years. I just don't have the same speed as I used to. So you're going to have to accept as a beginner starting judo as a middle-aged adult that you are not going to be faster than people who are 15, 20 years younger than you. You're just not going to be faster. You might be stronger, uh, but I think you said in your email that you're kind of a, a lightweight. I'm certainly a lightweight, and, and while I'm pretty strong for my size— 
I certainly can't contend with guys that that are you know 185, 190 pounds that also weightlift. I I can't I can't outmuscle them, nor should I try anyway. But you're just going to have to accept that you're going to be thrown a lot, that you're going to be thrown by people who are younger, and there's going to be very little that you can do about it in the beginning until you get your skill set up. And that'll that you'll get there. It'll take time, but you'll get there. You'll learn how to use your body and your physical abilities in a way that you can apply judo to somebody who is younger and faster. I I mean I certainly can now uh, because I do have certain skills, but honestly I would have very little chance against somebody who's a national contender in Rondori or even in competition. It just, 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 I just don't have the speed, especially if they are close to my size. And if they're, they're in several weight classes up, they're, they're still going to have enough speed up to, to really, you know, chuck me all over the place. They'll certainly have the size and strength and technical ability. So it's just one of those things. You're just going to have to accept it. And, but, but you can still get a lot of value through judo training and gain a lot of skills and a year from now when you go against somebody who's your age and your size you're you're going to be awesome to them you're going to be a monster to them so just keep training work hard you already have the you probably already have the work ethic between uh the Thai boxing and the Brazilian jiu jitsu of your past so you you understand what it what it takes to 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 work hard and judo is not very, very different, certainly not very different from the training aspect uh, when it comes to Brazilian jiu-jitsu. Just uh, it's a little more formal, depending on the club. The Marius Visor Q&A. Now, I said earlier that I was going to go through some of these question and answer sessions that Mr. Visor had on uh, July 11th. And I, I got to say, I am very grateful. I know some people at the IJF listen to this podcast every once in a while. Certainly, I know... I believe a fellow by the name of Mark Pickering has heard this podcast. So if you hear this, you know, please extend my appreciation to Mr. Visor for taking time out of his schedule to have these Twitter Q&As because I I think it's important to hear from the person who is at the top of the International Judo Federation to, to reach out to the people that follow the sport and take an interest in judo. So there were some interesting questions and I'm going to get to them. I just want to let you guys know in advance that as I read through these questions, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pause the recording so that you don't hear me say a bunch of um, ahs as I, re- as I read some of these questions. So if you t- tend to hear a break in the audio, that's, that's what's going on. Now I'll get my first question out of the way, and that's from me. I, I had written on the Twitter, much has changed in North Korea over the past year, and I believe Judo has an opportunity to demonstrate positive change. Will we see a unified Korea compete at this year's World Championships? Mr. Visor responded, this is the goal we are working on. There is a lot of work to be done to make this a reality in Baku this year, but we are hopeful. At Synergies asks, and I believe he's a listener of this podcast, do you have any plans to help judo grow by putting more resources into recreational judo, especially for adults? Or is the IGF just going to keep pouring resources <laughs> into kids that usually stop judo after a certain age? Mr. Visor responds, our motto is judo for all. We create chances for people of all ages to practice our sport. Judo for peace, judo for the world, uh, judo and veterans, judo are examples. We cater for all ages, abilities, and demographics all over the world. Now, I just wanted to point out real quickly here that something that we need to keep in mind when it comes to the IJF, even though the IJF does affect judo competitions at a state and national level, I'm talking specifically about the United States, but I'm sure the same kind of trends can be seen in other countries. We need to remember that the IJF is the highest level of sport competition. Think of it like Major League Baseball or the National Basketball Association. So at that level, the IJF is not going to be as concerned for recreational judo in the same way that the NBA is not going to be concerned about recreational basketball. Do you you know what I mean? And I think those type of questions are better suited for the state and national governing bodies of the country that you live in. And and in this case, I believe this fellow is in the United States. Now, certainly the competition rules affect 
competition, you know, all the changes affect competition, even at the lowest of levels. But in terms of growth, I really believe it has to come to the state and national governing bodies first. I just, I just think that's the order that you're going to see positive change. You, you start at the local level, you know, then the state and then the national level and the, in the international level, there's only, I just really think there's only so much the IGF could do. And it's really up to the individual club owners and, and, and the state governing bodies or the equivalent in whatever co- country you are in. I, I just, that's what I believe. I, I, perhaps some of you guys feel differently that the IGF should be doing more, uh, for recreational judo, but I, I just don't see them being that role. But I would say I would like to see more independent judo organizations spring up and deal with their rank and promotions and run their own tournaments and and be independent of what the IJF is doing. I think I, that's why I'm a big fan of what International Freestyle Judo Alliance and the Judo Black Belt Association is doing. I, I just think I think we need to see more of that. Because it's those kind of organizations that are going to really help judo grow at a grassroots level. And and as I really believe, the more grassroots people you get in, the, the, the higher the chances you're going to find people that can compete at a national and international level and, and just grow the sport as a whole. I mean, it's how every other sport in the United States does it. And I'm sure in other countries, it's not much different. All right, uh, moving along. At Puto World asks, Puro, as in P-U-R-O, because that's how you say it in Spanish. How can judo's mixed team competition become more competitive? Japan uh, beat Brazil 6-0 in the final last year, and there were a few surprises. Uh, I I agree with that. Uh, The mixed team of, uh, Mr. Visor responds, the mixed team event is is in its infancy, and I think some countries need more time to prepare better teams. I hope in the next edition and thereafter you will see a different value of contests. At Mongol Judo asks, what is the value of judo around the world? Mr. Visor responds, judo is the most educational sport due to the complexity of its values and principles and has very important tools for youth to contribute to a better society. And I happen to agree with that. At Nick J.M. Butler asks, what are your views on the demands by a a German athletes group that the IOC should give 25% of income directly to athletes, including a lump sum for all Olympic participants. Do top judo athletes get rewarded enough? That's an excellent question. In the judo sport, the athletes are awarded in every competition as, as well as the best judoka in each category receive a special financial award at the end of the year. But the Olympics is a different movement. Now, I said it before, I'll say it again, and I'll keep saying it until somebody does something different. I think there's more money to be had for the athletes at the, uh, certainly the athletes that make it onto the medal stand. I, I have to believe that they can be paid more. And for as popular as people say judo is, I mean, last year I heard over a billion people. I've said this so many times, I'm, I'm already start, starting to sound like a parrot. If you've got as many eyeballs watching judo as the IJF claims that they do, the athletes are not being paid nearly enough. I I simply believe that. And if you really, if there's more money to be had in judo, I I just don't know. Look, I'm not sitting on the the IJF board there. I've got no idea how much money they're bringing in, what kind of prize money they can have, what kind of sponsorships they have. But look, if you want to really grow the sport, the athletes need to be making more money. And it's as simple as that. Because look, if baseball players were only making $7.50 an hour instead of the millions upon millions of people uh, of dollars that they, that they currently make, uh, nobody would be playing that sport. Here's another interesting question by the same fellow, Nick J.M. Butler, at Nick J.M. Butler. Will the International Judo Federation join the International Testing Agency? Hmm. Mr. Visor responds, we are exploring this and it is a complex issue. We would need to open a medical clinic and this is too much. The requirements are so high and the testing authorities are not considering the costs involved for the sports. Interesting. I, I'm going to guess by international testing agency, that is a uh, an anti-doping agency. I, I don't know. so, But I do find the question interesting nonetheless. 
Mr. Weiser continues on that train of thought, the infrastructure and testing efforts as well. There are different conditions in a lot of countries, and most importantly, all approaches look like the world of sport is guilty of foul play and not the home of fairness and educational platforms for the youth. We will continue in this direction. We will need uh, per prosecutors or persecutors, and it is not a good precedent. At Crazy Judo Canuck asks, and this is the wife of Mr. Neil Adams, any thoughts of a magazine show to analyze each event in the future? Mr. Visor responds, the difference between our sport and exclu exclusive team sports is obvious, and this is very difficult to analyze hundreds of fights compared to several games. I, I, I hear that, but I think something like that could be done if you focus on the most popular athletes on the IJF World Tour. I, I really think that could be done. That would be really interesting. I know CNN has its Judo World program that I haven't seen in quite some time, but... I believe it could be done. I mean, look, tennis does it, and, and there are hundreds of competitors and hundreds of matches uh, when it comes to tennis. You know, currently Wimbledon's going on. At Hula, at Ehula underscore ATR asks, with the Olympics returning to the home of judo in 2020, will the IGF hold any commemoration, special events? Are you satisfied with the plans for judo in Tokyo? Excellent question. Mr. Visor responds, we plan to organize some special events to remember about the first Olympics for Judo in Tokyo, and we are considering a big celebration to mark the homecoming of Judo with respect to the legacy from 1964. In the 2020 Olympics, we will remember the Judo pioneers from 1964, and in this way, we will pay homage to this great generation who launched Judo's Olympic journey. From our view, the preparation is going well, and I hope the Olympic Committee will do their best to deliver a great games for judo. And I would like to add, I think it would be fantastic if in some way you can invite all of the living people around the world who participated in the 1964 games for judo and, and, and have some kind of special commemoration in that way. I, I know many of those folks are still alive, certainly, uh, Jim Bregman is the first name that comes to mind. I, I, I'm sure there are many, many others that participated in that first games. Some have passed, but some are still around, and I think those people should be given some special consideration. If not, at the games itself and maybe some kind of side uh, ceremony held at some hotel or something like that. I, I think that would be a, a, a wonderful gesture to bring to bring that and you know put it on YouTube, even if it's not done by NBC. Well, I know NBC won't cover anything like that. Uh, and by NBC, that's the NBC station in the United States for those outside of the United States. And for those outside of the United States, when it comes to the Summer Olympics, uh, Americans tend to really love swimming, the decathlon, track and field, and let's see, what else do they love? And basketball, for sure. I'm sure I'm missing a few sports, but... Judo is very, very low on the list of interest uh, for from a national perspective in the United States. Here is an excellent question asked by at Dan P Sport. An athlete could, in theory, lose several or all of their bouts in the mixed team competition and still win an Olympic medal. Are there rules to stop this? Mr. Visor responds, yes, this is a possibility, Dan. It is something we are thinking about in our team format and could reevaluate re in the future. Yeah, I, I, I hear that. <laughs> what if I was on the Japanese national team? I, I get smoked by everybody that I, that I stand in front of and, and end up with a, with a gold medal because everybody else carried me. Yeah, that, that shouldn't happen. I mean, that would never happen because I'm not Japanese, but you, you get the idea. At Kok at Kotaro Sasaki one asks, how are you planning to get judo, the judo industry bigger? We are continuously working together with the judo sport suppliers and we are supporting and encouraging always the sport industry around the judo. This is the reason as well as we have a huge number of suppliers which are involved in relation to judo equipment and logistics. Well, I think the IJF needs to look beyond the judo sport suppliers and start getting other sponsors that are unrelated to judo. Now, I know you've, we see the SOCAR uh, sponsor, and, and that's certainly a big sponsor, I would imagine. But to me, if judo is going to aspire to be a global sport, which it really is 
outside of the United States. Why not go after Coca-Cola? Why not try getting Pepsi to sponsor your your uh, your competitions? Why why not get well, maybe you don't want Budweiser, but you know what I mean. Budweiser sucks, by the way. But you know what I'm talking about. You you got to get if you want your global brand to expand, you need to attract global sponsors and you need to you need to act like you are as big as other sports around the world. I mean, as I'm watching the World Cup, I, I see all sponsors all over the place. You got Coca-Cola, McDonald's, and, and and other companies that I've never heard of that apparently are very popular around the world. So I, I, I just think I think I would like to see the IGF at least try to expand. And look, I'm not being critical. They probably are. They're probably trying. Um but my feeling is that you gotta think beyond sport and think beyond the suppliers. I mean, it's great to have those companies supporting and sponsoring you, but you I think you just gotta think bigger. Another question by at Synergies. I like to revert back to to Wazari being in a pawn, but why was the standard for Wazari lowered to include Yuko like scores? Mr. Visor responds, it is not lowered the value of Wazari. Because the difference between a good Yuko and a weak Wazari is insignificant, and we cannot measure by a microscope the millimeters of contact uh, of the body during contact with the mat because of the difference between every allocation. Woo, he's getting a little salty there. Well, you, you should have followed that up with a leg grab question. <laughs> I, I don't know about that response. In fact, I really don't agree with it. And I've talked about this on the podcast in previous episodes. I, I just think I love a Wazari Awaseti Ipon. I'm glad that they brought it back. And I understand that it's very hard to measure the difference between a Yuko and a Wazari. I, I can understand that. But I believe the the IJF referees are the best in the world. But I don't believe the difference between a good Yuko and a weak Wazari is insignificant. If it's a weak Wazari, then don't call Wazari. I mean, don't you get to the point where statistically it makes more sense to attempt throw, throws that are going to get you a Wazari rather than get you an Ippon? I mean, the, the chances of you going to get a Wazari uh, 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 or with a score that's a Yuko is going to be significantly higher than trying to get an Ippon. I don't know. I'm not a high-level judo coach. I suppose if I was and I had a guy that or a girl that that had an excellent, you know, technique that they can always reliably score a wazari with, I would create strategies so that that particular athlete would go for wazari and and, and never mind the ipon because it's it's going to be too hard. That just that's just my take on it. Maybe I'm Maybe I'm wrong, and that's why I'm sitting behind this microphone instead of on the side of the mats, but you know what I mean. Now, I know I've gone a little long with this Marius Pfizer Q&A, but I want to finish with this last question, and I didn't get to all the questions, obviously, but I, I this one really struck me as something very interesting here. Let's see. At Nika Gurini asks, Can you tell us about the very difficult situation in Georgian Judo Federation? We saw... One month protests, street rallies, street strikes, the use of weapons, resignation. What's happening? Does the IJF work on this topic? Mr. Visor responds, it is a strange behavior which the IJF finds difficult to understand regarding the stories in Georgia. We are investigating the situation of Georgian judo and we will soon have a conclusion. I always agree to make changes, but by democratic and legal ways, not by force. The Ministry of Sport in Georgia has to reestablish the previous administration of Georgian Judo and after with the statutes of the National Federation, the members have the right to initiate any statutory and legal procedures when they want to change the administration. Now, I had to do a little bit of digging to find out what the heck is going on in Georgian Judo, and, and the story is alarming. So I read this in an article from a online news source called OC Media. I don't know anything about OC Media. Uh, I believe this is a translation of of the article that I'm reading right here for, for English readers. So here's the headline. Former Georgian Judo Federation Vice President Shoots Judoka. 
One person is in the hospital after the former president of the Georgian Judo Federation, Lomer Zorzo Liani, opened fire on a number of judo practitioners, judokas, who were demanding the resignation of Federation President David Kekvishvili, according to Radio Tavishpuleba. Pardon my pronunciation there. The incident occurred on Tbilisi's central... um, uh, I'm not even going to try it. Avenue reports <laughs> reports said Judoka Soso Celari was wounded in the femur. Four people were arrested, among them the alleged shooter Zorzoliani, who currently coaches Georgia's youth judo team. Unconfirmed reports put Federation President David Kev, uh, Kishvili at the scene, but he immediately left after the incident. Yeah, no kidding, huh? Reports on the incident were widely circulated among Georgian social media users and sports fans on Thursday, while thousands are out in the streets with the slogan, Don't Kill Me, or hashtag Don't Kill Me, a coach tries to kill sportsmen, one of judo fan page complained, uh, demanding the government investigate and punish the perpetrator harshly. Now, I went to this Georgian judo fan page, and, and I didn't see anything more on that page other than what is already reported in this article, uh, that the fan page was in... The Georgian language, so I had to use translate.google.com. There wasn't anything new on that page um, that is apart from this article. So I'm going to continue with the article. In a June 1st press release, the Interior Ministry confirmed the news but mentioned only the initials of the accused as a standard practice, which corresponds to uh, Zozorlani's name. Yeah, maybe the next time I introduce myself on this podcast, I'll go by JDR. All right, let's see here. The two individuals were treated by doctors, and later one man reported to have been admitted to a nearby clinic with a gunshot wound. Police later opened an investigation for premeditated assault causing bodily harm. How about how about uh, attempted murder? That 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 would be a, 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 a how, can you, how can you get charged with that kind of a charge in, 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 instead of attempted murder? You you don't discharge a firearm in public aiming at somebody and then call it. Uh, premeditated assault causing bodily harm that that's attempted murder to me maybe maybe that is the equivalent of attempted murder over there i I don't know so let's see continuing on after the incident the youth team joined the national judo team in a protest the conflict between a number of georgian judokas and the judo federation began following the european judo championship in tel aviv where the georgian team failed to win a single medal for the first time in georgia uh judo history Continuing on, since this, the Judokas have been voicing grievances about financial transparency in the federations, demanding since May 4th that Kekvishvili resign. The president sacked the entire coaching team in response, but so far has refused to step down himself. Until Kegvishvili leaves his post, Judokas say they will not take part in training or participate in international tournaments. Judokas have been, had several rallies against Keg. Uh, the last one on May 27th. Now, as I understand it, um, Keg uh did resign from his post following this incident. I saw this on Judo Inside, which, I, I gosh, I can't believe. I mean, I, I check out Judo Inside fairly frequently, as should all of you. And I completely missed this article. Uh, I mean, I just I'm I'm reading it now, but I completely missed it when this happened. I I must have just been, you know, it's probably one of those uh, days or weeks or weekends where I was super busy with work. Uh, that that's my excuse, Hans. Sorry about that, Hans. Let's see. Kvishvili says, I am quitting the position to give chance for every judoka to lead activities in a peaceful environment and call on them not to become victims of provocations. I'm sure the latest projects will bring success to Georgian judo and our country. Well, look, I, I'm glad that that president resigned. I'm sure the Georgian judo team and the athletes have grievances that I just haven't been able to pinpoint exactly what those grievances are. Uh, perhaps they're just, you know, we they, they, the article talked about the financial transparency, and we've certainly seen that with USA Judo in the past. Thankfully, nobody got shot over it, but still, I, I mean... I don't want to see athletes from any judo federation get the shaft by the people who are running things. Because, look, the money and the support should be going to the athletes. They should not be going to people in leadership positions. I I mean, they're the ones that should be making less money, not more money. And I, I just hope that 
not only with the Georgian Judo Federation, but at any Judo Federation that the people that are running things truly have the best interests of the athletes. And up, Now, I don't know why not meddling in Israel matters that much. From my admittedly ignorant point of view, it's like, well, they made it to Tel Aviv. Were they hungry? I mean... Did they not have any financial support? Were they were they uh, sleeping out on the streets and, and then competing for uh, the championship the next day? I mean, I understand you want financial transparency. I just don't understand what was it about this particular tournament that caused such an uproar compared to I don't know the past four years or or however long Kev Kishvili was in power. And look, I'm not defending the guy. Please don't get me wrong. I'm just I'm just kind of wondering out loud. Gosh, I mean, I don't know. Maybe somebody over there can explain it to me. I, I would greatly appreciate it. If you want to try, uh, feel free to shoot me an email at judochopsuishow at gmail.com. Tayatoshi, the ultimate study. And this is the ultimate review of the ultimate study. No, I'm just kidding. So if you guys have been following my Twitter, which you all should at Levita Judoka, and if you're following my Facebook page, you would have seen me tweet out a tweet put out by Neil Adams Effective Fighting on the day that Taya Toshi and Ultimate Study was reviewed. So for those who are not aware or don't follow me on Instagram or Twitter or, or Facebook, shame on you for one. But secondly, Neil Adams has released a video series on Tayatoshi. And look, this is really phenomenal stuff. I'm going to get into a little bit of details, not too much details because I don't want to give away the farm here. But I have been aware that Neil Adams was going to put together a video series on Tayatoshi. And I wasn't sure what I was going to see, what I was going to expect. But when I saw the sale price of $47, to get in on early access for this video series, I couldn't resist. And guys, I've talked about this before. I'm a cheapo when it comes to money. I hate spending money. And look, it was not easy for me to drop $47 on this. And I'm not saying because it wasn't worth it. It's just I, I don't I don't even like spending $20 on myself. I, I, I kind of feel guilty. I just, I, I don't know. But I couldn't resist because for one, Tayatoshi is a throw that I've talked about in the past, something that I've aimed to get better at. My own judo instructor told me years ago that he learned the finer points of Tayatoshi from Neil Adams himself. So, And I, I, I'm not saying my Tayatoshi looks like Neil Adams. I'm just saying the way that I do Tayatoshi is probably closer to Neil Adams than anybody else. But it's a throw that I've, I've been able to get keep people on, but it's not one that I've ever felt comfortable with because... It's just, I, I don't know what it is about it. It's just, it's just kind of a weird throw, even though the way that I do it, it, it's, it's decent, but you know, I'm talking about demonstrative purposes, not in very rarely have I caught people in, in certainly not in competition in, in, but in Rondori, it's, it's not a common thing that I catch people with Tayatoshi. So I was very interested and intrigued to get this video series and I'll, I'll just put it this way. Neil Adams will never, ever have to leave his house again in jolly old England or wherever he lives to conduct a seminar on Tayatoshi because literally everything that you would ever want to know about Tayatoshi and how Neil Adams does it is in this video series. And when I mean everything, I mean, I mean literally everything. He doesn't have to leave. He could stay at home with his lovely wife, Nikki, and his 12 cats. I mean, he just he can retire. Because it, this, there is no reason why he would ever have to travel everywhere. He's put it out on video, and it's it's remarkable. Now, I want to be clear. I have not watched every single video yet, but I'm making my way through the course, and, and it's remarkable. So this is what I find remarkable about it. It's It's got to be well over, and I, again, I haven't seen everything yet. It's got to be well over two hours worth of content in a single for a single throw. Now I've seen other judo videos that were well done that cover a single aspect of judo. For example, um, Jimmy Pedro's grip like a world champion 
And I, I've also watched when he released it for free, Dr. Roddy Ferguson's Ugly Judo, which is really a fantastic breakdown of Moro Tegari. But, but Taya Toshi, The Ultimate Study, takes it a step further in terms of production, in terms of level of detail, in terms of the presentation. It's just, it's really fantastic. And so what I want to do is kind of give you guys an overview of the kind of subjects that you would get in this. Because, look, I know for a lot of you, once the sale is over, the, the regular price is $97. Now, that sounds like a lot of money, and, and it is. I mean, for me, I, I to spend close to $100 on anything is, is almost unheard of for me, unless i got to fix something on my car or in the house. But for those who've missed out on the sale price, I will say this, or I I would pose this question. Would you pay $97 to have Neil Adams come to your home and teach you Tayatoshi? I think every cheap person out there, myself included, would say yes, absolutely, hell to the yes. So here are the subjects that he covers in this video series. For one, it's it's Tai Sabaki, uh, the shape of Tayatoshi, the Kazushi. The legs of Tayatoshi, the, Kuzu, the Kuzushi versus the legs, creating shape, Uchikomi, attacking stances, the feet readjustment, the Kumikata of Tayatoshi, combinations, uh, defending, counters, transitions, uh, the Nagikomi, and at the very end of it all, he actually does a Q&A uh, of common questions that he gets regarding the Tayatoshi. I mean... I have gotten as far as the legs portion of it, admittedly, at, at this point. But to give you an idea, these segments are really long. So, you know, like I said, the Tai Sabaki of Tayatoshi that Neil covers, it's a 12-minute video. The Kazushi section of Tayatoshi is 18 minutes. Covering how you do the Uchikomi is about 13 minutes or so. So, I know a lot of you have been spooked by some of other pro some of the other products that are out there when it comes to covering throws and and the level of detail in throws and and look for Tayatoshi I know most instructors out there probably spend five to seven minutes actually teaching a throw and that's being generous but I mean this series breaks down everything and it, he he does demonstrate things both left and right side at least what I can see so far. And what I like about this video series the most, uh, so far anyway, is that this is not for people who are technically proficient in Taitoshi. Well, I mean, it is, but it's not just for those people. In a, Over a year ago, I did a review on Superstar Judo, and I think Superstar Judo is a fantastic product. But in my view, you really need to know what you're looking at to get a lot of value out of Superstar Judo. I, I, it's, it's a product that I don't suggest for beginners. But if you're somebody that really has a liking to Tayatoshi, it feels comfortable for you and you're a beginner yourself, I, I, I think it's well worth it. This is definitely aimed toward judoka of all skills, for sure. All skill levels, no question about it. I think everybody can get a lot of value, not just with Tayatoshi, but some of the some of the ideas and the concepts behind the throw can certainly be applied to other throws in judo. Now, I want to be clear before I continue on that that Neil Adams Effective Fighting has not paid me to do this. They have not asked me to do a review for this. This is just me trying to give the rest of the Judah community a heads up as to whether or not there is anything of value in this video series. And I, I got to say it's absolutely worth every single dollar in my opinion. That being said, I do have to talk about some of the negatives, positives and negatives from a technical standpoint. Uh, and when I mean technical, I mean in terms of the website and stuff. I've said it before. I am a software QA um, team leader by trade. So when it comes to websites and technology and testing, I tend to look at things with a far greater critical eye than the average person. But I think the things that I've seen with the site that prob I'm guessing Neil and and Nikki are not site administrators. They, they I have to believe they handle let, let a third party group do that. Um, but there are technical issues with the site. Uh, now I would say when it comes to the actual presentation of the techniques and such, I, I I think it's fantastic. I only question why didn't Neil have a microphone 
on his gi lapel like they do for the Superstar Judo Series. I, I think the audio uh, could have been improved. It's certainly not terrible. I think if I was doing a video series, I would certainly pay more attention to the acoustics of the room. I could tell they probably filmed this in a what looks to be a, a basketball gym with mats on the on, on the ground. And they had a nice background, don't get me wrong, and they covered it up really well. But I, I think given the acoustics, it looked like some kind of a big hall or some kind of a basketball gym as such. That was my impression. It does, That's not a negative. It's just when you record for audio in a place like that, you're going to have some audio issues. And there weren't, there weren't audio issues in the sense of the audio was cutting in and out. It was more along the lines of, some echo and sometimes the voice Neil's voice was louder than other times but all of it you could hear clearly it's just you know from a, again technical standpoint the audio issues could have been probably a little bit better uh the video was a plus and of course the content is a plus 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 that kind of thing it, it that's just perfect the content's perfect um now the website actually had some defects that I came across so when I'm logged into the website, on the right side, I see this blank instructor profile with the name John Doe and a bunch of uh, state uh, sentences that look like it's written in Latin. I don't know what that is, but it, it doesn't make sense to me there. Something else I notice is that the site does not recognize very well a completed versus a non-completed course. So I'll put it this way. When a course is marked completed, and I think it's a neat feature that if you watch a video series, you can mark it as complete. That's a feature I've seen on other websites. But when you mark, when a course is completed and then you log out and then you log back in, um, it, you'll be taken to the next video, which is great. However, if I click on the, on the complete button on all the videos that, 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 um, that I've watched to turn that into a mark as complete, and then I log out and log back in to watch the videos. I'm not taken back to the first video that's that's um, that's incomplete because you can you can mark the videos as complete and incomplete, uh, but I'm still not taken to the video that the, the the first video marked as incomplete. So it's almost as if there's some kind of database where your user profile stored and and the flag is just not being reset when I click on complete versus not complete. So. Again, that's more of a technical issue. It's not a big deal, but if I want to, if I'm on the legs portion of the video and I want to mark the legs and the Kazushi portion as as uh, incomplete versus complete, I log out and I log back in. I should be taken to the Kazushi video, not the next video after legs, and that's that's kind of what I'm experiencing right now. Something else I noticed, if you're a new user and you watch the introduction video and subsequent videos, and at the at the end of the video, there's a countdown to the next video, which is kind of neat. However, when you get countdown all the way to zero, the next video doesn't automatically play. So, you know, to me, I don't know if that's a bug. I don't know if that's a feature. Developers would call any defect a feature, just so you know. But to me, if there's a countdown on a video... For the next video to be played, I want the next video to be played automatically. I should have to force, I should have to be the one to stop the next video from playing and not just not have to click on the, the play button to play the next video if there's a countdown. It just doesn't make sense to me. And quite frankly, it's way too much effort for me to click on the play button. God forbid. <laughs> and now the only other con. And perhaps this truly is a feature, not a, a developer claiming it's a feature. There isn't an inherent option to cast a video to um, in the media player that they are using uh, to a TV. And I know many dojos these days they're starting to or incorporate TVs for coaching and studies and such like that. So I'm a little surprised that you're not able to cast this to a TV. Um, but then again, now that I think about it, if you cast it to a TV, what's the incentive of people buying the video? Aha! See, very smart. That's why it's a feature and not a bug. But I, I think the ability to cast, I mean, I would, I would say 99% of judoka are, are honest people. 
And I mean, and there's technically a way to cast to a TV using Google Cast. It's it's not hard to do. It's not impossible. If I really want to cast this to a TV in my house instead of watching it on my phone, um, you know, I can do that. Which, by the way, I would like to add as a as a plus, the site works great in a browser on your laptop or desktop. And the formatting on a mobile device is also very, very good. It's very sharp. The The page doesn't load in a funky way or anything like that. It's it's very well done. So I am able to watch on my phone and navigate the site uh, very easily. It's very user-friendly. That is a plus. Um, so I think those are really the only negatives. I didn't deep dive into testing the site because, quite frankly, I'm not getting paid. But I would like to put out there, if any of you that produce content want me to take a look at your site before you release it um, as a check with me kind of guy before you you release it to the to the rest of the world feel free to hit me up at judochopsuishow at gmail.com like I said I'm a, I've been a software QA tester for over 20 years so I'm an expert at that and as a special I'll be willing to to spend one hour on your site uh, for free and any time after that I would have to bill you um, about a hundred bucks an hour all right so before i wrap things up on this hideous episode i want to cover a bit of uh news that i just came across with in regards to usa judo uh usa judo has announced their team for the 2018 world championships i'd like to announce who those esteemed individuals are starting with on the women's side leilani akiyama who by the way she I just heard an interview with her on this judo podcast that's relatively new called the Judo Edit. It's, uh, I believe, uh, the host is out of Australia. And part one of that interview was released uh, not too long ago. So uh, very good interview, very enjoyable. I I, I liked it. All right, moving along, uh, Caitlin Buyasu, who is now Mrs. Caitlin Jarrell. Congratulations to you and your wonderful husband and Serge and everybody involved. Uh, Nina Cutro Kelly, Angelica Delgado, Amelia uh, Fulgentes, Alicia Gales, uh, let's see, Hannah Martin, who is also now Hannah Ogando, let's see, Anne Suzuki, Chantal Wright. Uh, that makes that that uh, makes up the women's team. Now on the men's side, you have some a lot of familiar names: Colton Brown, Nick Del Papalo, Adonis Diaz, Jack Hatton, Matthew Koch, L. A. Smith the third. Al Ajax, Tadehara, Alexander Turner, and Ryan Vargas. And while I'm rooting for everybody, I can't wait to see what kind of judo nawaza Ryan Vargas brings to the table this year. Because last year, everybody was claiming, oh yeah, that's Brazilian jiu-jitsu. No, sir, it was judo nawaza. Classic judo nawaza, something that we all learn in our local dojos right from the beginning. As a reminder, the World Championships this year are being held in Baku, Azerbaijan um, between September 20th and the 27th, which means for us U.S. Americans, we're either going to have to get up really early to watch it live on YouTube, uh, presumably that it's being broadcast live on YouTube, or we're just going to have to watch the replays at a later time. I know I am not getting up at 2 o'clock in the morning to watch judo, even if it's the world championships. No way. No way. All right. I, I think that's going to do it for me for this uh, this episode. Tomorrow's the World Cup, and I predict France is going to beat Croatia by a score of 4-2. to two. And I'm also going to go out on a limb and predict that the French's, the Frenchman, uh, the youngster there, Mbappé, is going to get a goal in this game and become one of the youngest people to ever score in a world cup final so that's my prediction so with that i hope you guys have a great day i hope you guys have a great week train hard stay safe out there and until next time i'm out open gangnam style gangnam style open gangnam style